sure. this is such a topical issue and this is a issue that Infosys actually epitomizes, I mean, in, in India, setting the entire standards, right? So, let me start off by talking to you about the tension that exists in a typical startup, in a private company. You've got investors who are pushing a company for growth, growth drives valuation. You have founders who are driven by that motivation as well. You have the media that's playing up all these stories of unicorns and everything. So everybody is aligned towards running for growth, growth drives valuation, etc., etc. How does one therefore sort of temper this excitement, this adrenaline rush inside the startup and say, hey, you know, you need to step back a little bit. Think about all the wonderful things that you talked about, namely, you know, the cohesive founders. And building values as opposed to valuation. Yeah. Well, I think even in the valuation thing, I think we have seen a shift, right? I mean, there was this massive push towards growth and uh, even if the growth was by burning a lot of money and then when we had the whole, uh, that was so-called zero interest rate policy and then when we have 6% interest rate or whatever, the whole game has changed and companies are now being asked to uh, become more profitable, reduce their cost. So already we have seen one shift, which is from growth to growth with profitability. The next shift is growing profitably and doing it ethically. So that shift, I think, is also beginning to come because as because actually hurting people, right? When, when the companies blow up in your face, then it affects everybody. It affects the employees, affects the investors, it affects public perception. There are global investors who worry about these markets. So I think uh, this is a natural thing and that's why the timing of this event is so important because uh, we are going to have to look at growth, growth and profitability, growth, profitability and ethical conduct. I think all the three are now going to become important. You know, typically when you look at a startup, the underlying mantra is the Wild West attitude, let's not worry about processes and rules, move fast, break rules, like Mark Zuckerberg said, and so on. At the same time, you've got a situation where uh, the founders are typically first-time founders, they're young, and there is a board that is involved with it. How does one, what would be your advice, let's say, to build this cohesiveness. If, if someone is a board member, what should they tell the startup and what should the founders in turn tell the rest of the team? No, I think the, the board and the investors have a big role to play because uh, you know, obviously founders are founders because they're amazing people who have great vision, ambition, they know how to design new things, product market fit and so on. Uh, but you know, you need a, 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 you know, guardrails on this so that they do all the right things, but also do it rightly. So I think the investors and, and uh, the board members have, have a huge role to play because they have seen this movie before and they've seen many car crashes before. So they have, their, it's their job to, you know, mentor founders uh, on, on these things to make sure that, you know, they learn from past experience. Because we have seen all this, there's nothing new that happening, right? We have seen Every 15, 20 years, we see these, these cycles of boom and bust. So I think it's important that the most senior people or the older people uh, bring in that, uh, that, that approach. And I think now we don't have to convince them. I, I think enough investors have lost money because of corporate governance failures. Uh, that's about as, as much, what, what are the message do you want? So because, you know, there's the other school of thought that uh, always say, Financial success hides a lot of things, right? People don't. So, what is financial mistake. success? In the sense that make money, no? I mean, what is yeah, financial success? That's right. In other words, I've been acquired for, let's say, a billion dollars, and therefore, what I've done to get to that point is not something that is openly discussed, unlike, say, in the public markets, right? Yeah. And that is something like you have pointed out in your talk as well. The private markets, you know, there's the. Uh, Transparency is one issue with regard to uh, disclosures and so on, and there is no real requirement to disclose. So therefore, in the light of the current developments, how do you see corporate governance itself evolve with regard to the private markets? Do you see that uh, no, I experiencing think it'll, something? It will come from uh, investors, because uh, when you do see episodes of corporate governance failure, and those episodes lead to an actual loss of value. Then I think the, it'll hit investors that 
this is not just some you know talk this is real stuff so i think i definitely see a lot more attention being paid uh, by investors to companies and the thing it also i think it will be seen in the when in, investors make investment decisions and their understanding of founders the founder psychology the founders value system i think is going to go up which so it starts from there so i think there's going to be a lot more attention to that aspect of uh, when you are deciding to invest in a company this becomes an important it's not just what business they are in or they are doing some ai or whatever it's, it's really going to be about these things so i th i think i mean all markets need some disciplining activity and we have had that uh, disciplining incidents so i think we, we actually i will go to a better place so you think that the things that have happened in yeah. the recent past will set sort of almost course correct a lot of the yeah, bad, yeah, bad behavior yeah and of course you know uh, like someone said we had to see a bottle where the bottleneck is not at the top so which means you have to start from the top yeah. and therefore from a selection perspective how does one look at startups how does one look at the investors and there's almost like a selection that occurs right i mean the founders choose an investor investor chooses the founders and so on is there any tips or something that advice or suggestions that you would like to give to either party saying look apart from looking at the business model and things of the kind how do you determine the softer aspects well, i can't say i'm a great investor so i'm not the right guy to <laughs> answer this question but i i think for me uh, founders matter a lot because i think business models you can pivot and so on it's not and you know technology is changing so you have to change but if founder quality is good then a lot of it takes care of itself and one of the things is therefore uh, governance is a subset of culture right i mean and you talked a lot about infosys's culture and infosys is well known yeah. for creating and that. remember i mean infos a company which has been around for 42 years it's gone through 6 7 technology cycles mainframes mini computers pc the internet client server web phone cloud ai everything is up and it's gone through multiple leadership transitions so if you are able to manage all these technology changes business model changes you are able to handle leadership transitions and still at the end of the day 42 years later you are in a good place it means that those value systems that you have built are solid enough to take you through this journey and that's the message really that if you really want to build companies that are built to last you got to do this stuff so focus on the values and not, and, and valuation will happen thereafter yeah valuation is automatic so therefore if there's a team right now a lot of uh, uh, series b and beyond companies that are on their path to ipos and so on what should the their their typical let's say um, weekly meetings or monthly meetings to establish that culture because a lot of new people are joining new partners are being set up right a lot of change happening how does one ensure that culture permeates no, i think the core team is very important the ceo the cfo the uh, cto uh you know c c chro you know all these people uh, have to be hand picked uh, the chief sales officer chief growth officer whatever whatever the the c c xo level has to be very carefully selected uh you have to uh, make sure that uh you know leadership gaps are identified and you have mentoring or coaching for people who need to build as leaders you have to make sure that the founders agree to a common set of values and principles also that they have a common time frame for anything you know time frame for exit time frame for ipo time frame for whatever so those need to be openly discussed yeah yeah That's because you, otherwise if you have a mismatch of expectations then you that leads to friction later so resolving that at a root cause level is very important okay uh, you know we've, i we're very conscious of uh, your time uh, that you have we've got about little over 6 minutes um, so i'll now throw it open to the audience if anyone has any questions please raise your hand uh, state your name and affiliation wait for the mic to get to you and please just ask a question no no commentary hi this is ankur mahishuri representing freeo a digital banking platform uh, uh sir one question to you uh, across the various leadership transformation within infosys have you experienced resi resistance or the mindset change in terms of the culture in terms of following the corporate governance because many leaders have the different thoughts whether that's a resistance you have faced throughout 
No, actually on the contrary, what my experience has been is that when you have a strong culture, it creates a safety net for not going out, out of that culture. Now, this culture is not bureaucracy, it's not about putting in bureaucracy, it's about putting a set of core values that everybody believes in. And once you have that in place, it actually acts as a, uh, you know, re, uh, sort of a, a guardrail for, for a company. I, I mean, I, I can, I don't want to get into specific examples, but, but I think that's actually very, if, I mean, if you want to build a company for the long term, if you, want, if you want to build a company and flip it tomorrow, that's a different game. But you want to build a company for the long term, you want to build in public markets, you want to have global shareholders, you want to deliver a continuous TSR, then it's, you have to make culture a strategic part. Culture is also important when you are a global company, because when you are a company, like Infosys operates in 40 countries, right? How do you bind all these people together? You can't just do it by having rules. So culture and the transmission of that culture across different societies, where the core values are maintained, is a very important part of creating that, that uh, fabric of uh, alignment. And therefore, is culture something that you practice every day? It's, it's in action, right? Oh, yeah. Not and also, it's, yeah, it's in action and you also have to have visible signs of application of rules if somebody doesn't follow the game, follow the rules of the game. Hi, Nandan, this is Ajay Nanavati here. Uh, you know, you, the two points that you made about the, the role of the board and the VC people sort of talking with their wallet, you know, voting with their wallet. So the question… So in the public market? Yeah, no, even in, in the venture capital or the boards, even in, in startup ecosystem, you, you refer to the, the role of the boards. Why, why is this not… why does this still happen? If, despite… do the VCs not do adequate due diligence on the governance aspect when they give money to a startup or… Are the boards too compliant? What, 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 what do you attribute these uh, fiascos to? I don't want to comment on poor VCs who are here, probably part of the co-hosts of this event. No, but I think, see, what happens in, 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 in when, how, how do you measure a performance of an investor, right? How, what, how does it work? You have, an investor raises capital. He raises it from a bunch of LPs. That money is locked in for certain years. They keep, you keep drawing down that money. And that investor wants to know how you are doing. I mean, I mean, the LP wants to know how you are doing. And the way you communicate how you are doing is by giving the asset value of the assets under management. And that means you, you, know, you take a valuation of a private company based on the last round and so on. So then once that becomes the metric, then you, know, you don't want to mess with that, right? Because if there's something which is happening and that can potentially affect the value of a company, then that will affect the value of your, of, of your thing and then your LPs are going to get mad with you. So I think there's an incentive issue here where, and it's not, it's a global thing. I mean, I mean look, there are so many, uh, in, again in public markets, you know, your, your price is known every day. In private markets, your price is not known till the next round. And if you keep postponing it, you know, you can make sure there's no down round unless you run out of time. So, if the entire system has an interest in keeping the fiction going. So, that also has an issue. Uh, no, no, this and I don't want to criticize anybody, I'm just telling you what. Uh, this yeah. is Jogen Desai at ISTEM. Uh, I heard a, I saw a very nice phrase which said, putting public good over the private one uh, in, in your slides. And if you are a startup trying to tackle some societal problems, how do you simultaneously also convince investors that you're not sort of running a NGO uh, while at the same time? Anyway, my experience is that both the NGOs and the startups I invest have been non-profits. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know about that. But having said that, uh, the uh, I, I think they're not incompatible. Obviously, you're, you're not running a, you know, of course. charity or something. Of course. But if a company, and also, it's also about attracting employees. I think, I have found that employees are much more interested if there's a sense of purpose of what you do. So, I think if you can combine that purpose argument which attracts employees, and you can deliver really good products and services, but also with thinking about the larger context, I think you can come out with a good business. 
We have time for last question. Naganan. Yeah, hi, Naganan from Idea Spring Capital. So, government has a lot of regulations, rules, whatever. Have you come across any instance in your personal journey in Infosys where you thought something was very ethical but going against the rules of what the government requires? And if so, how did you manage that situation of saying, all right, there's a risk I'm going to take? No, 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 I don't think so. I think because we look at both the ethical and the legal part of any decision. So, I don't think we have had that issue. So, I think the key point is when in doubt, err on the side of the white, yeah. <laughs> not, not get that. So, thanks a lot, Nathan. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. It's been Thank most wonderful. You. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.